Harry Tracy was of medium height, about five foot eight inches tall, according to prison records, with piercing blue gray eyes and sandy colored hair. While not necessarily conventionally handsome, Tracy was still said to have been quite the ladies' man. His face had a certain roughness to it that, coupled with smooth manners and a quick wit, made him one of the more desirable young men in Seattle's Tenderloin District back in the mid-1890s. And if we're being honest, it was the ladies that ultimately caused Harry's downfall, or should I say his love, for the ladies. Legend has it that despite some initial trouble back east, Tracy attempted to walk the straight and narrow when he first arrived in Seattle. Found him a job working as a student fireman for the railroad and rented out a little modest room over on First Avenue. Ah, but that nightlife was a calling, and the red light district south of Yesler Street weren't but a short walk away. Never much given to alcohol or gambling, it was most definitely the women that drew Harry, and a mere student fireman's salary damn sure wasn't enough to keep him satisfied. So Tracy started robbing. Began hanging at the train depot and following his victims back to their hotel rooms, making quick work of them and fencing the valuables downtown. This went on long enough for a special detective, King County Sheriff's Deputy Jack Williams, to be assigned to the case. And while the police did not have enough evidence to arrest Tracy at the time, they did give him a stern talking to, telling the young man to leave town immediately and not let the door hit him in the ass on the way out. Harry, with his usual defiance, stated that he'd leave town when he was good and ready and not a moment sooner. Of course, Harry would end up leaving later that summer, eventually drifting on down to Utah and finding himself in even more hot water. Still, one can only imagine Deputy Jack Williams' surprise when, years later, he'd find himself face to face with Harry Tracy yet again. And this time, only one of them would survive. My name's Josh, and you're listening to the Wild West Extravaganza. Following the shooting of deputies Raymond and Williams, Tracy hijacked a wagon and forced its owner to drive him towards Seattle. Believe it or not, they actually passed a roadblock without drawing suspicion, and by nightfall were on the outskirts of Woodland Park. By the way, this is part two and the final installment in the series on Harry Tracy. To hear part one, all about Harry's early life up to and including that gun battle with Deputy Williams that I just teased in the intro, check out the link down below in this episode's description. Once in Woodland Park, Harry, with the wagon driver Lewis Johnson as his hostage, ate dinner at the home of a Mrs. Van Horn. As he scarfed down his food, Tracy said that he was bound and determined to get into Seattle, said he'd feel safer there and wanted to be within the city limits proper by sunup, and his insurance, he'd bring Johnson with him. No hard feelings, though. At this point, Harry even had Johnson write down his full name and address, saying, quote, I've troubled you a lot, and if I ever do get a big wad again, I'm going to make things square with you. At around 9 o'clock that evening, a grocery boy appeared, unbeknownst to Tracy, and Mrs. Van Horn quietly whispered for the kid to go fetch help. As luck would have it, Sheriff Cudahy was just a mile away in neighboring Vermont. He had just arrived via buggy, alone, from Bothell, and as soon as he heard that Tracy was holed up at the Van Horn place, immediately began asking for volunteers. A few brave citizens agreed, and once armed, they took up positions around the house. To their astonishment, moments later, Tracy emerges. Only problem is, he's flanked by hostages. The aforementioned Lewis Johnson and an old man named Butterfield, who had the misfortune of boarding with Mrs. Van Horn. Keep in mind that Harry had no idea the sheriff was out there. He was just being his natural, cautious self. It was clear he was headed straight for the Johnson's wagon, so Kudahy took careful aim and waited thinking that he'd get a clear shot once Tracy tried to climb aboard. And chances are he would have too, had it not been for a couple of unwitting constables, Raleigh and Brees, blundering onto the scene. I guess they had heard the news and were looking to come to Kudahy's aid. They spot Tracy, still flanked by Butterfield and Johnson, and ask the trio if they'd seen the sheriff anywhere. Seconds later, Brees notices the rifle that Harry was trying to conceal under his jacket, puts two and two together, and yells out for Tracy to drop the gun. Instead, Harry simply swings it out and puts a bullet square in Brees' forehead. Constable Raleigh is close enough to actually reach out and grab Tracy's arm, while at the same time attempted to draw his service pistol, but it's no use. Harry was just too damn quick, and he fished out a revolver of his own and pumped two rounds into Raleigh's belly. All of this happened in just a matter of seconds, mind you. Sheriff Kudahy and his makeshift posse scramble to open up fire, at which point Tracy just disappears into the night. Now, Constable Raleigh would succumb to these wounds fairly quickly, 
and Captain Brees and Deputy Raymond back at the cabin, Harry Tracy had just killed three men in the span of a few hours. Four, really, depending on how you look at it. Deputy Williams, who had been wounded back at the cabin, would go on to live several more years, but when he did finally die, it was from complications of those wounds he received back in the summer of 1902. The following day, July 4th, the good citizens of Seattle began arming themselves. Rifles were handed out at hardware stores as Sheriff Kudahi and a posse of 50 men began searching the woods between Seattle and Bothell. Others were strategically positioned at various points along roads and rail tracks, but mostly it was just a game of hurry up and wait. Tracy could be anywhere, holed up out in the woods or sitting in somebody's house watching all the commotion outside through a window. Unless he popped his head up or there was another sighting, the posses really couldn't do much of anything. Sheriff Kudahi admitted as much that evening during a press conference. Said he couldn't possibly say where Tracy was, but that he and his men were watching closely for the next appearance. Quote, The chase has been a hard one, but we are not beaten yet. Tracy must be exhausted by his last flight across the country, and we must keep hard after him. End quote. And as had been the case for nearly the entire hunt, tips began flooding in. Some credible and others not so much. Tensions were so high that a poor Japanese man was nearly gunned down when a posse mistook him for Tracy. In truth, <clears throat> by the way, I'm recording this directly after I recorded the first episode in this series. If you hear my voice cracking, it's just because it's still not at 100% after that little cold I had a couple weeks ago. I feel fine, though. My voice just isn't quite where it needs to be yet. Hopefully soon. Now, by the morning of the 4th, Harry had made his way all the way to Green Lake and held a farmer and his family at gunpoint while they made him breakfast. During the brief sojourn, Tracy described the previous day's events in vivid detail and retold the story about how he killed Dave Merrill, adding that he didn't want to hurt anybody except, quote, those who were after me, and I'm not going to forget those people that have done me favors, end quote. Almost as if to hammer this point home, Tracy refrained from tying the family up due to their 18-month-old baby, saying, I'll not tie you people up because somebody will have to tend to that baby. But one thing I want you to do, and that is to give me a solemn promise that you will not tell anyone I've been here for the next 48 hours. End quote. The farmers agreed. Of course, they fucking did. They just wanted to be shut of the guy. And once again, Tracy departed with promises of money in the mail. Now, obviously, the couple didn't wait no 48 hours. They immediately notified the authorities, and the farmer's wife even stated that she tried to poison Tracy's food, but he was just watching too closely. The law quickly arrived on the scene, bloodhounds were dispatched, and surprise, surprise, they lost the scent after just about a mile. The general consensus was that Harry was now bound for the Cascades, but he fooled everybody again by going the exact opposite direction, right back to Puget Sound. Forced a fisherman to sell him all the way to Bainbridge Island, where, on the afternoon of the 5th, he held another family at gunpoint, the Johnsons. I want you all to understand that I am a desperate man. My name is Tracy, and I would kill you all were it not for that pretty little child. I want all I can get to eat and good clothes in place of the ones I have on. If you give me these things, you will not be harmed. Harry then addressed Miss Johnson, saying, Madam, I dislike to order a woman about, but I want you to hurry up and get me a big dinner. And I want lots of coffee. And I actually don't think that's a bad line. Some of you single guys might want to try someday, preferably on a first date. Just let me know how it works out. By 9 p.m., Tracy was gone, leaving with the Johnson's hired hand, John Anderson, whom he then forced to row him from Bainbridge Island all the way back to a peninsula southwest of Seattle. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to play a little armchair fugitive for just a moment. I'm having a really hard time figuring out the reasoning behind sailing to Bainbridge Island and then back to the mainland all in the course of a day. If you look at a map, there's not a whole lot west of Bainbridge even nowadays, at least not in the way of civilization. Assuming Harry had enough ammunition and a little wilderness know-how, if he could have made his way to the Olympic Peninsula, where the present-day Olympic National Forest is located, I kind of feel like he could have hit out indefinitely. Then again, me personally, if I, God forbid, ever happened to be on the run from the law, I think I'd head to about the biggest city I could find, preferably somewhere with a lot of public transport, and just kind of melt in with the masses. And who knows, maybe that's why Harry Tracy was so bound and determined to get to Seattle. Maybe he felt safer among people. Or maybe he just didn't care to spend a long time in the forest by himself with nobody to talk to but Rosie Palm and her five sisters. That said, as you'll soon hear, there is some evidence that Tracy was receiving help from the outside. 
If he did try to rough it over there on the Olympic Peninsula, he'd be completely cut off from that assistance. Hell, there wouldn't even be farmers that he could turn to for food. This is all just speculation on my part. Like I said, Tracy had Anderson sail him all the way back just southwest of Seattle, and then, once on shore, he made the man carry all his food and ammo. Remember what I just said about help? Well, according to Mr. Anderson, he and Tracy marched through the forest toward the town of Renton, where they encountered four men, one of whom Harry greeted as Fred. He and Fred conversed for a while before Tracy tied Anderson up and blindfolded him, leaving one of the four to stand guard. Harry and the others returned about an hour later with a bottle of whiskey and continued their hike, all six of them. That evening, they took refuge near a railroad track, and once again, Anderson was tied up. This time left completely alone, but just like before, Tracy and the mystery men show back up at daylight. As far as Harry's overall condition goes, per Anderson, quote, Tracy never got tired. He was always walking fast and watching both sides. He got cross at me when I forced him to slow up sometimes. His health is good, and he hasn't a scratch. He has been eating heartily and regularly and has built up his strength and told me he was now in better condition to fight and travel than at any time since he left the penitentiary at Salem. He said, I'm getting stronger all the time, and I've never felt better in my life. End quote. Now, at some point, they broke off from the four allies, and Tracy came upon two girls and a young boy picking berries. Introducing himself as the famous fugitive, he accompanied them home, assuring them along the way that he would never hurt a woman. Once they arrived, Harry made the acquaintance of the family matriarch, a Mrs. Geralds, before leaving with the little boy as a hostage and returning shortly thereafter with Anderson. Tracy then gave the kid a couple of stolen watches and told him to go sell them over in Seattle and use the money to purchase a brace of revolvers. I want two Colt 45s and two boxes of cartridges. Now, if you preach on me, kid, you'll hear from me. Then, just to drive this threat home, within the boy's earshot, Tracy told his mama, if he betrays me, I'll kill your two other children, referencing the Barry Picking Sisters. This, of course, was just another one of Harry's bluffs, and once the boy departed, he assured Mrs. Geralds that she had absolutely nothing to fear. As for the kid, he had more pluck than Harry gave him credit for. Fearing for his mama and sisters, he immediately alerted the law, and it weren't long before a posse descended upon the Gerald's home. Tracy noticed him, though, and, as gentlemanly as could be, concocted a plan to have the women leave with him as a human shield, sort of like he did back at the Van Horn place. And just like before, all plans were immediately derailed by a pair of interlopers. And this next part is almost unbelievable. Apparently, two highly inebriated men, not part of the posse, just what the newspapers would later describe as meddling fools and idlers from Renton, drunkenly muscled their way inside and asked if Tracy was there. Harry hid in a room with the young ladies as Mrs. Geralds assured the men that he was not. Finally, they just stumbled their way out, likely saving their own hides in the process. Weird little interlude, and it does seem pretty amazing that Tracy didn't kill both of them on sight. And you gotta wonder what the hell the posse outside was thinking. Up to that point, at least, they were under the assumption that they had gone unnoticed. Nonetheless, that night, once it was good and dark, Tracy tied Anderson up, and despite previous plans, he left alone. Slipping quietly right through the posse, just like he had done dozens of times before. You know, I do find Tracy to be a pretty fascinating study. The dude was a stone-cold killer, no doubt. I'm sure a little touched in the head, extremely dangerous, and he made no qualms about being a thief. But also, he did seem to go out of his way not to harm civilians. During Harry's time on the run, he took a ton of hostages, but never made any untoward advances on the women folk. About the worst he ever did was just leave a few people loosely tied up. He wouldn't hesitate to drop the hammer on anybody hunting him, be it a lawman or vigilante, but everyone else seemed to be off limits. By all appearances, Harry Tracy lived by a code, albeit one of his own making. And this is something I've noticed when researching other criminals from different eras, even admitted crooks and gangsters from modern day times. They all espouse a certain honor code, and some very strongly. I'm sure this is a topic more suited for a psychologist than a dumbass podcaster, but I've always wondered if these codes are true beliefs, you know, guiding principles that they just really feel down to their core or just more of a narcissistic coping mechanism. You know, maybe rather than accept who they are, they instead rewrite the narrative in their own minds. Sure, I might rob a bank, but I'd never hurt a kid, so I'm not all that bad. Or yeah, I'd shoot a cop trying to arrest me, but I've never touched a woman without consent. None of us, even bad boys, want to feel like monsters, right? Then again, there may be some truth to it. I mean, with all of Harry Tracy's faults, was he as bad 
as those prison guards that tortured Delmaine back in the previous episode. Those guards were never hunted down like dogs or labeled as menaces of society. They never had a price on their head, and the warden that allowed all that shit to go on at his prison, the worst that ever happened to him was he lost his job. I personally believe that one day I'll stand before my maker and have to answer for what I've done. I gotta admit, that's a scary thought. Thankfully, I've never had to take a life, but I kind of feel like torturing somebody to death would be far harder to explain than shooting someone in self-defense. Just one more thought, and I promise I will stop rambling. As much as I sympathize with Harry Tracy, and by sympathize, I guess I mean I understand his reluctance to return to prison, I don't know that being nice to his hostages is all that great of a flex. At the end of the day, just the mere action of him forcing his way into those homes and holding families at gunpoint is dramatic as hell. The men were likely left with feelings of inadequacy for the rest of their lives, and the women never again able to feel safe in their own homes. In my opinion, being polite doesn't really make up for all that. And if one of those men had tried to fight back, Tracy sure as shit would have killed him. And it would have been his own damn fault. Now that posse did end up rushing to the Gerald's home in a huff, cutting Mr. Anderson free and putting the hounds on the scent using some old clothes that Tracy left behind. Per usual, the dogs lost the trail about a quarter mile down the road, but upon crossing the river, they immediately picked it back up. At least they did until they ran smack dab into a nice heavy dust and a cayenne pepper. Far as I know, that was the only time Harry tried that particular trick, and needless to say, it did hamper the chase quite a bit. Undaunted, the handler gave his dogs a good nose cleaning, whispered some sweet nothings in their ears, and in no time flat, they were back on the hunt. And this time, for whatever reason, Tracy had a very hard time shaking him. He ended up doubling back, making a big circle through the timber and cutting his own trail, heading north again towards Lake Washington. The hounds followed, but by the time they hit the lake, the trail went completely cold. So demoralized were the volunteer posse men at this development that most of them just up and quit and went on back home. Harry didn't have that option, so instead he again changed directions and beat feet to the south. In the days that followed, there were numerous sightings and someone fit in Tracy's description even forced his way into a home and attempted to use the telephone. Then, just outside of Tacoma, Harry took yet another family hostage, the Johnsons. After demanding food and a change of clothing, he ordered the man of the house to go into town and procure a pair of 45 Colts. Remember, he pulled that same shit back at the Gerald's home, so I'm guessing he really wanted those damn pistols. And once again, Tracy offered up a bluff, told Johnson that if he didn't do as he was told, he'd murder his wife and children. In the meantime, Harry gathered the remaining family members, Johnson's wife, a 17-year-old daughter, and a 15-year-old son, and took him to a hill behind the house. Apparently, Tracy wanted a nice vantage point in case anyone tried sneaking up. And this next part is very interesting. While awaiting the return of Mr. Johnson and those two twin colts, Tracy allegedly regaled the family with stories from his days riding with Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch. Now take that with a grain of salt, as I don't know this is something that the Geralds said, or whether or not the local press just sprinkled it in to make the story more interesting. Much of what we know about Harry's time on the run does come from newspaper accounts, and you know how that be. Speaking of which, this wasn't just some local story. This manhunt had garnered national attention, and there were daily updates in damn near every paper in the United States. Even then, President Teddy Roosevelt was obsessed following the news closely and allegedly somewhat intrigued by Tracy's ability to elude the law for as long as he had. So yeah, there's no telling what kind of stories the press was concocting on the daily just to drum up sales. I will say this much though, when Tracy was admitted into that prison back in Utah, his official description listed a bullet scar on his left leg. Where he got that wound, what the circumstances were, is anybody's guess. For sure, Harry Tracy was involved in more than what we're discussing here. I just wish I knew the particulars. You know, that crime that got him locked up in Utah was relatively petty, but who the hell knows what else he had done prior to getting caught. How often had he slipped in and out of Browns Park in the past? Is there any truth to him riding the Hoot Owl Trail in Montana? I wish I could say one way or the other, but for now, this will have to remain a mystery. If you have any additional information on Harry Tracy, if I've gotten anything glaringly wrong, please don't hesitate to reach out and let me know. Josh at WildWestExtra.com. I think one thing is clear, though. Tracy may or may not have rode with Butch Cassidy, but he could have. Hell, judging from his actions during this manhunt, Tracy would have fit right in with the James gang. 
Good, bad, or indifferent, the man had nerve and he had grit. Had he been born a decade or two prior, the name Harry Tracy might be among the most well-known of the Old West bad men. Now, Mr. Johnson did return. He was a good boy and kept his mouth shut, but he was only able to procure one revolver for Tracy. To make matters worse, it had a seven and a half inch barrel as opposed to the shorter six inch barrel that Harry had asked for. Tracy wasn't very happy, but he ended up cooling off rather quickly before air quotes borrowing a couple of dollars from Mr. Johnson. He then took everybody back inside, had Mrs. Johnson pack him up a passel of food, and after shaking hands all around, Tracy headed on down the road alone. Mrs. Johnson would later tell reporters that during the stay, Harry spoke twice of his mother, fondly, and that she could see tears welling up in his eyes. Now, as touching as that is, she also expressed fears that Tracy would return and kill her husband, saying that she wouldn't be able to sleep in her own home again until he is either dead or out of the country. As it turns out, she would not have long to wait. That evening, a little after midnight, Harry came upon two men guarding the railroad tracks and took off running. They unloaded their scatter guns after him and, despite the darkness, ended up putting at least a few pellets in Tracy's hip. He hobbled through the woods about 50 yards before running smack dab into another lawman, Deputy Crow. Harry pretended to be a fellow posse man, but as soon as he got close, he raised his rifle and popped off a couple of shots. Luckily for Crow, Tracy didn't stick around to make sure any of his bullets found their mark. Other than a slight powder burn on his face and an exciting story to tell his grandkids, Deputy Crow was unscathed and lit out for the nearest telegraph station. Skip ahead to 8 a.m. that morning. Sheriff Kudahy arrived on scene along with those bloodhounds, but say it with me, class, the trail soon went cold. A couple hours later, Harry was spotted on a farm some five miles south of Covington Station. The hounds were once more deployed, and this time they were able to follow the trail for a full eight miles the longest thus far in the entire manhunt. However, just like always, they eventually lost the scent. The following day, July 12th, 1902, Tracy limped his way into the home of the Portraits, an elderly French couple, said he was the man the posse was after and that he wanted some food. Now, if Tracy had previously been at the peak of physical fitness, as the hostage Anderson had claimed, things had recently taken a drastic turn for the worse. That hip wound was hurting something fierce, and according to the portraits, Harry's face appeared thin, drawn tight, and gaunt, and he was so exhausted he could barely lift his fork. Nevertheless, after finishing his meal, Tracy was on the move, limping his way back into the safety of the forest. He didn't look like a criminal, Mrs. Portrait later recalled. He treated us very nicely, and it is hard to believe that he has such a black record. Next day, around 5 p.m., Harry was spotted by a 10-year-old boy just south of Enumclaw. The kid would later state that Tracy seemed very tired with dark circles under his eyes and that he carried a Winchester in his arms with a makeshift holster around his waist holding two revolvers. Harry asked the kid for directions to the road leading to Buckley, thanked him, and went along his way. The youngster immediately pedaled into Enumclaw and alerted the adults. There was a great clamor of hounds and men, but Harry had done circled back and it weren't no use. On the afternoon of the 14th, Tracy was still in the vicinity of Enumclaw, where he forced his way into the Garner home. Fugitive ate dinner, ordered one of the Garner boys to give him a shave, and then departed with a new pair of pants. Meanwhile, Sheriff Kudahy decided to follow a somewhat iffy lead. More and more intel kept coming his way, backing up the idea that Tracy was receiving outside help, and what seemed like a reliable informant even claimed to know the exact location of their hideout a remote cabin on Lake Sawyer. Desperate to make an arrest, Kudahy took 12 of his best men and made the long hike, getting lost twice in the process before finally locating the cabin. They breached the doors, guns drawn, and it was empty. While there were remnants of an old fire and what appeared to be bloody rags in the corner, Harry Tracy was nowhere to be found. Defeated and deflated, Sheriff Kudahy quit the search completely returned home and said that he would not go out into the field again unless he had definitive news. And I think I do understand the man's frustration. It was like chasing after a damn ghost. Couple that with all the fake Harry Tracys that began popping up, and it had to be downright frustrating. There was one jokester who walked into a logging camp demanding dinner, and although he was armed, he did not match Harry's description. But that's nothing compared to a genius by the name of William Nixon. Old Willie entered into a Seattle saloon and began quietly intimidating one of the female employees, claiming to be Tracy and strong-arming her into buying him beer. Said if she told anyone, there would be consequences. 
Well, she told, and the next time Nixon set foot in that saloon, he got his ass beat black and blue and locked up in jail to boot. Hell of a price to pay for a free beer. Meanwhile, the real Harry Tracy had indeed crossed the Cascades on horseback and pushed into the much more open and arid land of eastern Washington. Not far from Wenatchee, Harry stopped at a fruit ranch, taking both a meal and a fresh mount, before pushing on to the Columbia River, where he ran into a pair of stubborn ferry operators who flat out refused to take him across until sunup. Guess they was allergic to working in the dark. Tracy spent a few nervous hours watching his back trail before impatiently waking the men up at first light. And once on the other side of the river, Harry refused to pay him. Said that he was broke, but even if he had money, he wouldn't hand it over due to their uncooperativeness. Now, I don't know why I found that so funny. You know, in the past two months, Tracy has killed, what, seven men? The three guards at the prison, Dave Merrill, Deputy Raymond over at the cabin, then Brees and Raleigh at the Van Horn home. And he left another Deputy Williams all but dead. Dude was absolutely not afraid to pull a trigger, yet for whatever reason, he put up with insubordination from these damn ferry operators. Kind of reminds me of that scene from No Country for Old Men, where Anton Chigurh is arguing with that old lady at the trailer park, looking for Llewellyn. Those ferry operators, much like that fictional lady, had just come across the deadliest person they would ever encounter for the rest of their lives. Yet they somehow stumbled away without so much as a scratch. Who knows, maybe this was just part of Tracy's code, or maybe he was just plumb tuckered out. I don't know. Either way, news began to spread as Tracy worked his way east through the towns of Almira and Wilbur. Even Sheriff Cudahy got excited about the numerous sightings and decided to investigate in person. The working theory now was that Tracy was bound for the hole in the wall over in Wyoming, looking to take refuge with his own. If that's the case, the man had quite the long journey ahead of him. Unfortunately, we'll never know as Tracy's days were about to come to a very abrupt end. Somewhere around the 2nd or 3rd of August, Harry was discovered by a 19-year-old kid named George Goldfinch. Young George had been out riding, alone, when he came upon Tracy's solitary camp. Harry invites the kid to take a load off, insists that he stay for dinner, and they even discuss a recent boxing match, Jeffries versus Fitzsimmons. Somewhere during the conversation, Tracy introduces himself proper and informs George that he is now a hostage. Don't worry, I won't hurt you. I just want you to guide me to the nearest ranch. Which Goldfinch does, taking Harry to the Eddie spread, ran by brothers Lou and Gene Eddie. Tracy enjoys dinner there at the Eddie Ranch and, uncharacteristically, lets George Goldfinch go on back home. Apparently, George told him that if he didn't return soon, his people would grow suspicious. Surprisingly, however, Goldfinch did not go run in his mouth off. Matter of fact, he returned to the ranch the very next day, thinking that Tracy would be long gone. The only thing is, he weren't. Truth is, Harry had his sleeves rolled up and was in the process of helping the Eddies build a new barn. You know how secrets are, though. They're not the easiest things in the world to keep bottled up inside, especially when you're 19 and the secret in question has a large sum of money on its head. This time after George left, he did start talking, and word spread throughout the nearby towns of Davenport and Creston. Indeed, there in Creston, an ensemble of unlikely heroes began to form. Turns out a youngster named Joseph J. Morrison overheard the news and began gathering his buddies, all of them rank amateurs in their early to mid-twenties. And I say amateurs, but that's not exactly correct. They were just very inexperienced in the ways of manhunting. One of them, Maurice Smith, had served in the Spanish-American War, but he was a lawyer by trade and a recent transplant from back east. Likewise with E.C. Lanter, just 23 years of age and fresh out of medical school. These three attempted to recruit George Goldfinch to guide him to the Yeti place, but young George refused thinking that Tracy might not be happy with him after this recent turn of events. So instead, they enticed one of Morrison's hunting buddies, Frank Lillingren. To round out the posse and give it an air of legitimacy, they also talked part-time constable C.A. Straub into going with them. On August 6, 1902, they made their way to the Eddie Ranch in a buggy, finishing the last leg of the journey on foot so as not to draw attention. And believe it or not, these wannabe vigilantes were able to sneak all the way up to that barn and get to within 50 yards of the notorious Harry Tracy. Worth pointing out that these guys were a nervous wreck by this point. The doctor, E.C. Lanter, wasn't armed with nothing but an old black powder gun, a dubious reliability, so he urged the lawyer, Maurice Smith, to take the shot. But I guess being the gentleman he was, Smith decided to give Harry a chance to surrender. Throw your hands up, Tracy! Smith barked in the most authoritative voice he could muster. 
And Harry did exactly what he was told. He put his gun down and came out, hands in the air, meek as a damn kitten. He even began thanking the men, saying that he was glad that his long flight was finally over. And no, I just made that last part up. Of course, Harry Tracy didn't surrender. At the sound of Smith's voice, Tracy immediately dove into the barn towards that trusty Winchester of his. Still uncertain as to who he was up against and how many there was, Harry then made his way from the back of the barn to a hayfield. Both Lanter and Morrison noticed and put their long guns into action. Harry did the same, turning and snapping off a few shots with his Winchester as he ran, before diving among some large rocks for cover. As he did so, he tripped and lost control of the rifle and had to scramble to retrieve it. By this time, all five men of the posse were rushing out into the field right at him, so Tracy started firing off rounds in earnest. And while he did succeed in stopping their advance, all his bullets were strangely falling short. Not only was Tracy fighting with the setting sun directly in his eyes, but as would later be determined, during that fall he had knocked loose the front side of his rifle, thus rendering it practically ineffective at anything past a couple of dozen yards. Since then it was now or never, the boys from Creston split up and tried to flank Harry, forcing him to leave the rocks and making a dash for a basin in the distance. Of course, their aim weren't much better than his. Maurice Smith was basically just walking rounds in on Tracy. Anytime the fugitive would appear in a break in the tall grass for just a second or two, Smith would fire, look for the dust plume, and adjust aim. This happened a few times before finally he thought he got a hit. Excited, Smith quickly unloaded his gun in that general area, and then quiet. A deafening silence fell as the young heroes strained their senses to pick up any sign of movement in the tall grass. All of a sudden, Lanter raised his rifle and let her rip, but just turned out to be a rather large hog who squealed in fright and ran off back towards the barn. Crazy as it sounds, this did help to break the tension somewhat as the emotions of the last few minutes caused the young men to begin laughing uncontrollably. Here they were, chasing after a confirmed killer, still out there and as dangerous as a cornered mountain lion, and they was giggling like school children. At least they were until they heard a muffled shot from what sounded like a pistol. Seeing as how the sun was going down and none of them felt that strongly about going into the tall grass in the dark, they decided to stay put where they were and wait till daybreak. Round about midnight, here comes Sheriff Gardner of Lincoln County, and he too thought it would be a wise choice to wait until morning. At least he did until first light. As the men of the posse mustered up courage to descend into the tall grass once more, the brave sheriff declined to join them. Even so, Lanter and Smith advanced cautiously, rifles at the ready, until they found what they was looking for. Not 20 yards from where Smith thought that he got off that lucky shot the day before lie Harry Tracy, covered in dirt and blood and deader than disco. Upon further inspection, they saw that at least one of Smith's rounds shattered Harry's right leg and likely severed his large artery. Tracy applied his belt as a tourniquet, but I reckon he saw the writing on the wall. Quickly losing his life strength and unable to move, Harry pulled his own revolver, placed it against his right eye, and pulled the trigger. Sheriff Gardner, sensing all the commotion, rushed out immediately and began waving his pistol around and demanding to take charge of the situation. Sometime later that day, Harry's body was hauled to the town of Davenport, where a mob of souvenir hunters were awaiting. Lining up on both sides of the street, they began reaching out and pulling off buttons at first, and then just flat out ripping off pieces of Tracy's clothing. And that was just the beginning. Once the body was placed inside the coroner's office, the crazed crowd busted in the windows and stormed inside. Within minutes, Tracy was stripped completely naked as the damn human vultures tore away his hair and skin, leaving the corpse absolutely riddled with bloody patches where entire chunks of flesh had been hacked away. Sheriff Kudahy, who had arrived in town just a few minutes prior, was so overcome by the scene that he began sobbing. Now, there was a bit of a dust-up as to who got to claim Tracy's body. Sheriff Kudahy could have done so had he chose, as he did still hold a warrant on the man, but he was as done as done could be at this point. He just up and left town. Stalwart Sheriff Gardner said that it was he who should deliver Harry's body back to Oregon and get the reward, since he was killed in his jurisdiction, but them young posse men who did all the work refused to let the lawman at the body. Good for them. Finally, the governor ordered Creston Constable Straub to take possession and oversee the transport back to that prison down in Salem. And you're not going to believe this next part. Before they loaded Tracy onto a train bound for Oregon, they poured acid all over his face just as a way to dissuade any future trophy hunters. Guess the idea was to make him look as unrecognizable as possible. 
Even still, Constable Straub had to physically sit on the coffin for the entire train ride, clutch at a rifle. According to his interview with the Spokane Spokesman Review, if he hadn't, quote, souvenir hunters would have cut so many chunks off it that there wouldn't have been much left, end quote. Be that as it may, a mob was still able to power their way through as the coffin was being transferred to a wagon down in Salem. The lunatics managed to smash the casket into pieces and made off with the splinters, along with even more strips of Harry's putrefied skin. Good lord. Eventually, what was left of the poor bastard was laid to rest in an unmarked grave there at the Oregon State Penitentiary, covered up with a heap of lime right alongside his old buddy slash murder victim, Dave Merrill. Now, Merrill's body had been discovered way back on July 15th. And sure enough, just like Tracy had stated, Dave had three bullet holes in his back. Apparently, a lady had been out walking with her son when the kid got a good whiff of the decomposing body. One of those smell-it-before-you-see-it kind of deals. Dave's brother, Benjamin Merrill, was able to positively ID the body, as did the prison warden. And no, neither the woman nor her son were given any of the reward money. The governor of Oregon even released an official statement trying to rationalize his decision, basically saying that the bounty was offered as a way to entice men to risk their lives in search of the fugitive, and that simply stumbling upon a dead body while picking berries or walking was just pure dumb luck, blah, 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 blah. Typical politician bullshit. Speaking of rewards, you will read that the bounty on Tracy's head had reached to over $4,000. Not sure how true that is, but the final amount they ended up getting paid was just 2500 And you better believe Sheriff Gardner, who showed up after the fact and didn't even have balls to go into that tall grass after Tracy, tried to claim it as his own. The nerve on this guy. Hell, so did George Goldfinch. Remember him? At least he had a semi-legitimate claim, as he was the one who first spread news as to Tracy's location over at the Eddie Ranch. There was a lawsuit, but in the end, the reward was divvied up among those five amateur posse men. Smith, Lanter, Morrison, Lillengren, and Straub. And I think that's fair. They would have each ended up with around the equivalent of 15000 in today's money. And I doubt they had to buy their own drinks for quite some time. Now, like I said earlier, for research, I leaned heavily on the book The Saga of the Outlaw Harry Tracy by James J. Nystrom. And if you don't mind, I think the last couple of paragraphs from Mr. Nystrom's book are a fitting end to this story. The furor that Harry Tracy created in the months in which he had been hunted slowly died down, even in the places he had passed through on his mission to escape. Today, there are few markers on his trail of mayhem. No placards where he shot it out with deputies or held hostages for days. The man who so boldly and brazenly marched across 500 miles of thick underbrush, tall grass, and dense forests has left only the impression of a memory. People living in these areas held vivid memories of the circumstances throughout their lives. Today, all those who remembered are gone. It is their descendants who keep only a memory of a memory. Perhaps it is fitting that this outlaw, no matter how bold and daring, has left little or no trace on the landscape of the Pacific Northwest. His deeds and exploits should not be overly aggrandized, since he was, in fact, a convicted criminal, a thief, and a cold-blooded murderer. He was also very polite, courteous to women, not a wanton killer, but a self-justifying dispenser of his own crude code of frontier justice with a keen, though rough-hewn sense of humor. The story remains as a monument in the factual history of the growth of a region, the Pacific Northwest. It is still the same land that it was in Harry Tracy's time. Even though now it is widely settled and much of the dense undergrowth and timber has been cleared, the countryside still retains its basic wildness and overgrown nature. It does not take much neglect for the rain-soaked climate and fertile soil to reclaim its prominence over any kind of civilized activity. It is within this cover that the outlaw Harry Tracy hid from capture and eluded every posse that was dispatched to capture him. It was perhaps only in the Pacific Northwest that Harry Tracy could have been able to become a legend however fleeting. Well said, Mr. Nystrom, and with that, I reckon that's about all I got on Harry Tracy. Thank you so much for listening. Please, if you like what you hear, share this episode. If you're looking for more true tales from the wild and woolly west, head on over to wildwestextra.com. While you're there, hit that contact button. Let me know what's on your mind. That's wildwestextra.com. All right, I hope you and yours have a very happy Thanksgiving. Hope you stuff yourself silly with turkey and pie. And if you're a hunter, I hope you got a deer already. And I hope that the Dallas Cowboys lose. How about that? 
Till next time, try not to break the law. You might find yourself bleeding out in a Washington hayfield, and nobody deserves that. Not even Cowboys fans. Adios. And I want lots of coffee.